uh, good to be with you this morning. Uh, as Barry has said, with this Sunday being the first Sunday of Advent, we're going to take some time together to consider hope. What is hope? Why is hope important for us today? Why is it significant for us? And I think for me, up until fairly recently, uh, hope has been a bit of a mystery. I didn't quite understand hope. It seems strange to me that in 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul talks about what love is and what love isn't, that at the end of that passage, he says, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three. The greatest of these is love. And for me, I could understand faith abiding. I could understand faith being one of those things because it's through faith that we live in the good of what Jesus has done. Faith puts Jesus at work in terms of us. I could understand love being there because God is love. And Jesus asks, what's the greatest commandment? And he'll say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. But what about hope? I hadn't spent too much time thinking about hope and I don't know if hope is something that we actually think about. It's important. But I'm not sure we think about it too much. You see, hope seemed like a bit of a lightweight in that three of faith, hope and love with the two heavyweights. But coming to understand hope has been really important for me. Coming to understand what hope is and why hope is important. And this morning, now, our time together, we're going to unpack that a little bit and look at it. You see, I think part of the problem for me was is as with the rest of us, we all grow up in a certain environment, in a certain culture, and we get word, we get used to words being used in a certain way. And that brings a certain meaning and definition to words. And just to explain that a little bit, I want to look, it's kind of a slight off topic, I want to look at the word peace. Because maybe when you're growing up, you heard your parents or your teacher say things like, oh, just give me some peace and quiet. Just give me some peace, meaning just a bit of quiet time with nothing. Or you might then watch the news and you'll see reporters talk about peace talks, meaning an absence of conflict between nations. Or maybe even through the church. For me, I was brought up through the church. And you hear people talk about this peace. This is a common phrase that I heard growing up through the church, oh, I have a peace about it. And for me, that was a little bit uh, troublesome in some ways because for whatever reason, I was of an anxious disposition. <laughs> I had an anxious makeup, and so I was like, what is this peace that people talk about? And I'm not saying that it was wrong to talk about that, but the way it was implied to me or the way I understood it was that just this peace just floats down from nowhere. But something that's been really helpful for me as I've grown in my walk with the Lord is to recapture the biblical definition of these words that we use every day. It's to see what does the Bible have to say about these words. It's to see the context in which they were written and the context of the surrounding verses by which they're written. And for me, at one stage of my life, I started to look into this word peace. And it seems consistent to me through the scriptures that peace comes as a consequence for trusting God. It doesn't just float down from nowhere. It says in Isaiah, <clears throat> he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast. It says in another translation, whose mind is stayed on him who trusts in the Lord. We can expect to know peace if we'll trust in the Lord. Another verse would be from Philippians, which Bessie read for us this morning, where it says, be anxious for nothing. That's a faith choice. That's a faith decision. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. 
There's a decision of faith to be made in order to know peace. Just one last example. I often think of the children of Israel in the wilderness. They were God's people. They arrived there at the right time and by the right means. God did it. He led them out. He gave them the instructions and they followed him (laughs) through a miraculous route. But yet they had no peace. And they said, oh, that we were back in Egypt. Life was better there. They romanticized the past. They were following what God had said, but they had no peace because they failed to trust him. And God was angry with that generation. He'd worked, he'd rescued them, he'd done a work in their life, but they didn't experience it because they failed to trust God. And so we need to have a real understanding of what God says in his word. As we come to it with an open word, allowing him to be our teacher. It's good to be in church. It's good to to listen to what's shared at church. Don't get me wrong. But for us, we can't sidestep our responsibility of seeking the Lord. He's a God who loves to be found because he wants his children to know life in his name. And life isn't found anywhere else. And that's why hope for me was a little confusing. Because as, as Barry said... The world uses the word hope when something's unsure. When we're uncertain about something, all we can do is hope for it. So as you might be able to tell, I'm from England. And just on Friday, the World Cup draw was made for soccer. And England have been put in a group that they should win. They probably won't, but they should win that group. And next summer, uh, 28 times, I'm hoping that England win that group. And I'm hoping that they move on from there. And I'm hoping they'll win something in my lifetime. (laughs) But I'm not sure that they will, if I'm honest. So all I can do is hope. I can't influence what's going to happen. Maybe we're hoping for a white Christmas. I'm not, but maybe some people are. We can't influence the outcome, so we just hope for it. And so I think for me, I translated that kind of hope and read the Bible with that understanding. But as Barry said this morning, hope that is based in Jesus speaks of confidence, speaks of a guarantee, and speaks of certainty. Hope that is in Jesus speaks of certainty. What Jesus has done in the past guarantees for us our future. What Jesus has done in the past guarantees for us our today. Not everything about today, but it guarantees this, that we can know life today. Regardless of circumstance, regardless of health, regardless of financial situation, regardless of family situations, we can know life in his name. And so with the rest uh, of our time together this morning, we're going to look at three verses on, in hope. And they come from the book of Colossians. In Colossians 1, on three de- separate occasions, the word hope appears. And in a sense this morning, they talk of, if we can put it this way, be- because it's actually one thought, it's one package. But it speaks of three tenses of hope. It speaks of a hope that draws people to Jesus. A hope that attracts people and brings people in. It speaks of a hope of life today. And it speaks of a hope of being with him where he is, free from the presence of sin. And all that is important. If we fail to have a hope, we won't express faith in what we know to be true. So the first verse I want to look at with you is from Colossians 1, verse 3 to 7. I'll just read the verse to you. It says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, 
which has come to you just as in all the world, it also is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. So firstly, I want to consider this, that for any of us that has placed repentance and faith in Jesus, has accepted him as a hope laid up for us in heaven. And that's good news. It's certain, it's guaranteed because it's on, based on the work which Jesus has done. You see, ever since man fell, ever since Adam fell, man has had a problem. And the problem has been sin. And sin brought separation between God and man. To say the same thing a different way, sin brought death. Because God is life. And if you're absent of God, if God's withdrawn from you, then you're left with death. Life isn't found outside of him. And so the law came and the sacrificial system. And that served as a covering for the sin, a covering for the problem. But it was all done in faith of the one who was to come. And in John's Gospel, in John chapter 1, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John puts the focus off himself and puts it on Jesus. He says, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came and he didn't just cover the sin, he took it away. He removed it from us. So that we could be clean if we'd accept him. And that we could once again know fellowship through relationship with him. He came so that we might be related to him. And so because of that, we have a hope of being with him one day. Because the thing that got in the way... Our sin, which was under the righteous wrath of God, has been dealt with. It's been removed from us. We have a hope of being with him free from the presence of sin. In heaven, none of us has ever been there. None of us have seen it. But yet it's still guaranteed. It's still certain and assured because it's on the basis of what Jesus did. And when he hung on that cross, he says, It is finished. No longer a sacrifice needs to be made for sin. It was enough. And we have been forgiven. It's one of the most powerful uh, things to know. That you are forgiven. And we know that, but do we believe it? Often as Christians we walk around under the wet blanket of self-condemnation. Because we fail to believe the truth. And in a sense, we say to Jesus, thanks, but it wasn't enough for me. It didn't cover my sin. We throw it back in his face. It's not humility. It's unbelief. And we need to recognize this. We have hope because the sacrifice was enough. And one day we'll be with him in heaven. It is finished. Next verse is from Colossians 1, verse 21 to 23. And it says, Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death, in order to present you before him, holy and blameless and above reproach, if you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. And again, from this verse, the hope of the gospel, we could look at the same thing we've just looked at. But just to say this, that the hope of the gospel speaks of a hope that draws us, a hope that brings us to Jesus. And that would imply to someone initially coming to Jesus, but it would imply to us today as we daily do fellowship with him. You see, the gospel is a message of hope. 
for two main reasons. Firstly, it's true. If it wasn't true, then it would be hopeless. But it's a message of truth, and we know that because it was spoken by the one who is, is himself the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. If anything is truth, it's found in Jesus. And in, in Titus 1, 1 to 2, he's called the God who cannot lie. And so it's a message of hope because it's a message of truth. Secondly, it's a message of hope because it speaks of a rescuer. It speaks of the one who will come and rescue. Matthew 1.21 says this, She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. That's not just a, sa a salvation of yesterday. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We're being saved from the power of sin as we live daily, putting faith in him. And we will be saved from the presence of sin when we're with him, in his presence. You see, it's good news because man is lost. It's good news as a rescuer because we need Jesus. Quite simply, you were never created to live without him. And so there's a message of hope that draws us. Because we see that Jesus wants us. There's nothing that we can do that he needs. But yet he wants us. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. There's a sense it's good to be lost because it means someone's looking for you. You're valued. He wants you. And so we have hope this hope of the gospel. Hope leads to faith. When we see that there's this rescue, he wants to rescue us because he loves us. It'll lead us to put our faith in him. And faith leads to salvation. Faith lead, leads to Jesus being active in my life. We saw that in that first verse in Colossians 1. He said, we have heard of your faith in Christ, which produces a love for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Hope, because of the hope, they had a faith in Christ, which produced a love for all the saints. That's only the work that Jesus can do, is to produce a love for all the saints. That's the hallmark of someone who's walking with Jesus. Jesus said this, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It's an absolute given. It's the best apologetics there is. He said, by this all men will know. There's no maybes in there. But he says, if you have love for one another, if you'll handle the gospel, if you'll believe it, and if you'll let it be part of your life. In John 6, after Jesus fed the 5,000, the people say to him, Jesus, what must we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God. This is God at work, that you believe in him whom he has sent. We want to celebrate Christmas. We want to see God at work. Learn to put your faith in him. Learn to trust him. It's the best celebration of Christmas that there can be if we would respond accordingly and live by faith and say, Lord Jesus, I'm yours. You're mine. Today there's a hope of the gospel, there's a hope, a promise of life. Thanks. The language of faith is thanksgiving. It recognizes what Jesus has done is enough. He's enough for us whatever we face today. And then finally, just to kind of wrap up because time's almost gone but in Colossians 1 verse 27 he'll say Christ in you the hope of glory before that Paul says I've been made a minister of the church that I might preach the word of God he said this, this uh, word of God was something that was a mystery 
from the past ages and generations. But it's now been revealed to you. And he said the preaching of the word of God is this Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so what does that mean? What is glory? Glory here isn't talking about heaven. It's not how the, the word is used. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Just to unpack that a little bit, we'll see that the glory of God and the law of God talk about the same thing. In 1 John 3, 4, it says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. For sin is lawlessness. Or other translation, one who say, Anyone who sins breaks the law. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To sin is to break the law. To sin is to fall short of the glory of God. Glory is the standard that God demands of us. So what is glory? Again in John 1 verse 14 it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The glory of God, in a very simple way, is tells us who God is. Jesus came and he showed us what God was like. It's God's moral character. The glory of God. It would mean other things besides that too, but what we can see here is that we've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. As human beings, we, we were created in God's image. God said, let us make man in our image. And as God created man, he breathed into him the breath of life. The very life of God breathed into the man. And so as God looked at his creation, he said, good. As he looked at man, he says, good, very good. Because he sees himself. He sees his own life being reproduced within the man. God is good. He's the only standard of good. And if God said that he saw good, it's because he saw himself. As man lived in this faith, obedience relationship with God. And so now we read that Christ in us is the hope of glory. We could say that this way, Christ in us is our hope of knowing life. It's our assurance of knowing life. It's our assurance of being found righteous before God. It's our assurance of living a life worth living. <coughs> living a satisfying life. Life in all its fullness. Because it speaks of Jesus, Christ in us. Him living where he does. Expressing himself through us. You see, the Christian life isn't easy. And it's not difficult either. It's impossible. And only Christ can live it. You can't live his life for him. But you can get out of the way and let him live his life in you. And so today, because he lives in us, God, we have hope of glory. We have hope of life. Because Jesus is bigger no matter what you're facing today, again, as we've seen already, you have hope today, hope of glory, life in all its fullness, because he's bigger, and so there's no circumstance which you're in that can, that can rob you of life. But whatever circumstance in you can know life. Paul writes from prison, he says, I know what it is to get along with humble means. I also know what it is to live in prosperity. In whatever situation I am in, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. His reference point on life isn't his, circ isn't his circumstance or his situation. It's the God who indwells him, who has no equal. And so today we can go into this Christmas season and into the rest of our, li of our lives responding to this truth in confidence. We have a hope for today that hope for today should lead us to place our faith in Jesus 
and not only that, we have hope for eternity. Paul says, if we've hoped in Christ only for this life, we're to be pitied above all men. But there's a hope beyond that. He explains that, he says, because we've hoped only in this life, it means that Jesus isn't alive. But there is a resurrection. And we live day by day recognising his resurrection. And one day we'll go to be with him, free from the presence of sin. It's good news. We need to handle this today, this season, and every day.